when the building changes from the, de the, the developer's hands to your hands, you will be eligible for the rebate. But because you've assigned it to the builder, you will get credit for that rebate on your statement of closing adjustments. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to fill in any applications. Your lawyer will ask you before closing, are you planning to move into this place as your primary residence or are you planning to buy it as an investment? If you tell them it's your primary residence, they will say, okay, eligible for the rebate, we'll give you credit for it on your statement of closing adjustments. But if you tell them, hey, it's an investment, you won't get credit for it. You will have to apply for it after, as long as you have that one year lease in place. Okay, so that's a difference. The difference between somebody who buys it as their primary residence and somebody who buys it as an investment is you will get the rebate up front if you're buying it as your primary residence. But if you're buying it as an investment, you're going to have to make application for it. Okay, as long as somebody rents it out for a year, even if it's an investment, you can get it back, the full amount. Yes, yeah. In order, yeah, there were, you have to have, you have to show proof of your agreement of purchase and sale, your statement of closing adjustments, and your, when your lease, and make the application to the federal government in order to get that back. Now, it's important not to lie. Some people, because people say, okay, I'll tell them it's my primary residence because I'll get that rebate up front and I don't have to worry about applying for it. But the government checks. They ask the, the builders for who's living in that apartment, and then we'll get a list of who's living in it. And if things don't match up, and if they see that it's somebody else living in there other than the owner, they'll contact the, the, the owner, who's the landlord, and they'll say, hey, you got credit for this rebate. You owe it back to us. And they might charge penalties and interest on that amount. And then you're going to have to reapply for the rental rebate. And it's and you don't want to mess with the CRA on this kind of stuff because they will nail you. You know, it's it's easy for them to find out who's living in that building and who's who's occupying the units. And so it's important to be honest because the money is just it's really a timing thing. You'll get it back, but you'll just have to wait till they approve your rental rebate application for you to get it back. Rami, let me ask you, what if somebody moves in as their principal residence and, you know, things change and all of a sudden, you know, they need to move out before the end of the year, then they rent it out. Is that going to have any indication on how they apply for that rebate? Well, it, uh, if they've lived in it for a fair amount of time and there's good reason why they're moving out. So the government talks about uh, the terminology they use as a frustrating event. And a frustrating event can mean life changes, things like marital breakdown or job change and you have to move out of the city or your child is going to go to another school which is 100 kilometers away and you don't have the ability to have them commute every day to go to that other school, you know, financial difficulties or death in the family, you know, those significant life events that you have really no control over sometimes. So that shouldn't have an impact on the, the change in the rebate status. But I should go back because there's another issue and it happens all the time in the GTA with respect to sale of condos. There's what's called your assignment clause. So in many cases, somebody buys a home for, you know, a condo for $300,000 and um, they say, wow, it's gone up to 400, $500,000. I can turn this around and make a quick $200,000 on this pre-construction condo that I bought three or four years ago. Well, uh, first of all, so you have your assignor, who's the initial purchaser, and you have your assignee who will take over the obligation uh, to purchase this particular unit. That assignee does not get credit for the rebate, even though it may be their primary residence. They don't get credit for it. They also, like the investor, must apply for it afterwards. And I would say, you know, there's various articles that are out there. I saw one in a, in a real estate magazine that says 50% of more people who buy for investment purposes or on assignment do not apply for the rebate. And it's a significant amount of money. It can be up to $27,000. Most times, you know, depending on the purchase price, I'm not going to get into the 
the you know actual calculations, but a lot of money is being left on the table by people who buy on assignments and who buy for investment purposes because either they're not aware of the rebate or the paperwork confuses them uh, or for for lack of knowledge. Uh, they just they don't know about it. Yeah, twenty seven thousand dollars they could be missing out on. The important thing to understand also is there's a two year deadline to apply for the rebates from when possession changes. Not from when you get occupancy, but from when possession changes. So it actually belongs to you now because that's the point in time that you've paid the HST and now you can apply for the rebate. So if you've closed on June 1st, or let's use a, a better example. If you closed on March the 5th, 2019, uh, and today we're at March the 4th, tomorrow is your two-year deadline. And if you haven't applied and you go over that deadline, forget about it, unless you have some very, very serious uh, life changing events that happened, you were sick, you know, you had to, you know, you had to have treatment, etc. Uh, they won't consider a, uh, you know, even if you're out by a day, they won't consider that uh, you crossed that deadline. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the situations where somebody buys new construction and they're not eligible. Is there ever a situation where they wouldn't be eligible for it? Uh, yeah, if you don't, if you don't occupy it or you don't rent it, if it okay. stays, if it stays empty, mm -hmm. you can't apply because it has to be a residence, it has to be a residential unit. Mm -hmm. But there are other things that can gum up the works. Uh, and people, for example, a young couple, they need help with the financing. So they go to a relative, which is not necessarily that's immediate family, not brother, sister, parents, grandparents. Uh, if they get a rich uncle, for example, to help them finance, and that rich uncle goes on the goes on title, that can gum up the works because everybody on title is supposed to be eligible for the rebate, at least immediate family. So let's say, you know, your dad helped finance the the uh, condo sale or the condo purchase um, and he went on title that's fine because he's immediate family but if an uncle did it who is outside that immediate family then the government would look at it and say well not everybody here is eligible for the rebate that uncle lives you know in in whitby and this condo is in toronto uh, sorry we're denying the rebate you can correct it, but it's it's uh, you know difficult to correct. So it's important that uh, title be limited to those who are actually going to reside in the unit and immediate family members, not a not a, a benefactor friend or not a benefactor you know uncle or whatever, but but whoever is going to reside in it plus immediate family. That's one thing that can come up the works. Okay, so what if somebody has multiple people on a deed? So I know people that are, you know, young that can't purchase something on their own. They will partner up with another friend or another family, let's say, to be able to purchase something, right? Are they, they eligible? All have to, they all have to move into it. It all has to be their primary residence. Now, if, no, if they're buying it for investment purposes, that's a different story. But if they're buying it uh, as their primary residence, everybody has to be, everybody who's on title will have to move into it if they're not immediate family. Mm -hmm. But that, if it is an investment and they pull their money together to buy something and they rent it out for one year, they're all eligible. They can um, get that good. rebate and in fact, And in fact, as an investor, it can be a corporation, it can be multiple people, it can be even offshore residents who buy here for investment purposes, whether they're from the US, from Europe, from Asia, wherever they may come from. And you see that a lot, particularly in the in the markets of uh, Vancouver and uh, Toronto, a lot of foreign money comes in and they buy for investment purposes. I, I just did a rebate for someone who resides in Florida. He bought a condominium unit on uh, through his corporation and the corporation got the rebate. Okay, so let's talk about the process then. So let's say, you know, somebody uh, wasn't able to get the credit for the rebate, which is what you mentioned in the very beginning of this interview, which is the ideal situation. They got to apply for it. What does a process look like? Okay, well, again, the process is a little different for each of the rebates. So when we're talking about the GST 190, which is purchased from a builder, the people who will be applying for that will people who purchased on assignment. So they don't get it uh, right up front, and they they you know the assignee 
now has to uh, apply to the federal government for this rebate. So it's a form that you have to fill in with a bunch of numbers and a bunch of data, where you are, where, where you live now, and you know, uh, is this your primary residence, et cetera, et cetera, and closing dates and prices, et cetera. You have to provide the government with your agreement of purchase and sale, your statement of closing adjustments, and your one year lease, because unless there's a long-term lease in place, and that lease could have started on occupancy, uh, you just have to show the government your intent that you wanna um, lease this for a long period. So there's often a huge gap between occupancy and, and now change of possession, you know, closing. Uh, but so it could be five months, it could be eight months. Uh, but you can only apply, you may have a long-term renter in there pre, 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 um, pre change of possession, but once the possession changes and once that unit actually belongs to you, it doesn't matter that the long-term lease predates the, uh, the closing by a few months. So you put that package together, you send it off with some signatures to the government. It's the HST department, the business services department of the government. And within generally six to eight weeks, a little slower now because of COVID, uh, you'll get your money back. So that's number one. However, there, there is another issue with assignment sales. Going back to that example that I gave earlier, you, you bought an assignment, you bought it $300,000, all of a sudden you see, wow, this thing's worth $500,000. Uh, and you decide to sell. That's not a good enough reason to the government that would make that incremental price. So you know you're paying HST on the 300,000, but are you paying HST, the new purchaser, are you paying HST on the 200,000, right? People often don't know the answer to this question. I've asked lawyers about this. I know the answer, but I've asked lawyers and, and real estate agents and accountants, and they're a little unclear. Clarity comes in when you talk about intent. So if it was the intent of the original purchaser, the, the assignor, to move into that unit, and he was frust he or she was frustrated by some event. Again, going back, a significant life event like change of jobs, and you got to move out of the city, or a death in the family, or a breakdown uh, of a marriage, or a couple, let's say, who bought it, and they were just a couple, but four or five years later, now they have the surprise birth of twins, and the you know, the single uh, bedroom condo that they were deciding to move in now is not, doesn't meet their needs. Well, that is, makes the incremental price exempt from HST. But if that assignor says, wow, I can make good money on this, or wow, you know, I was sort of going to move into it, but I decided not to now, that $200,000 is subject to HST. And most agreements of purchase and sale have standard clause in them that says HST is included in the purchase price. As such, a buyer, the assignee, when he pays that, for example, so he pays that 300 plus the other two, five, and he closes for 500, the extra $200,000 that he has paid has included HST. And that buyer is protected because the agreement of purchase and sale says, it's included in the purchase price. It gets a little complicated, but the assignor, the assignor might be liable to the government if the government finds out and that $200,000 can have, includes a significant amount of HST, uh, about $34,000 of HST. The government can say, hey, you collected it, you owe it to us, right? And so these assignors are often surprised when they get notices from the federal government that says, you owe us money on the sale of this uh, property that you sold on a sign. I always caution real estate agents and and, um, and lawyers who are, who are doing these uh, agreements and these um, uh, purchase and sale agreements that they should really be aware that there may be some repercussions to their uh, assignments uh, in terms of liability for HST. That's a really good point because imagine that $200,000 profit that person's thinking, they're now paying income tax on it and 
an additional HSD? It'll probably be, it'll probably be a capital gain. It's, a, it's an investment par, corporate. It's an investment property uh, which they sold. So that $200,000 gain will probably only be half, ca- half tax at capital gains tax, but they'll still owe that $34,000 of that embedded HST in it. But here on the other side, there's a good side to this for the buyer, because when that buyer closes, they only generally get one statement of closing adjustments, and that's from the builder. And that statement of closing adjustments will reflect the original purchase price of $300,000. And that original purchase price will have HST credits associated with it. However, that $200,000 also includes HST and they can claim for the embedded HST for credit on that embedded HST as well. And I give you a perfect example. I had uh, a case where uh, a young woman bought a condo in Pickering and she uh, bought it on assignment. So the original purchaser purchased it for 300000